the Aeneid by Virgil. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content. And now, on with the story. Book 5 The Games of the Fleet Meanwhile Aeneas and his fleet in unwavering track now held mid-passage, and cleft the waves that blackened under the north, looking back on the city that even now gleams with hapless Elissa's funeral flame. Why the broad blaze is lit lies unknown, but the bitter pain of a great love trampled, and the knowledge of what women can do in madness, draw the Teucrians' hearts to gloomy guesses. When their ships held the deep, nor any land farther appears, the seas all round, and all round the sky, a dusky shower drew up overhead, carrying night and storm, and the wave shuddered and gloomed. Palinurus, master of the fleet, cries from the high stern, Alas, why have these heavy storm clouds girt the sky? Lord Neptune, what wilt thou? Then he bids clear the rigging and bends strongly to the oars, and brings the sails across the wind, saying thus, Noble Aeneas, not did Jupiter give word and warrant would I hope to reach Italy under such a sky. The shifting winds roar athwart her course, and blow stronger out of the black west, and the air thickens into mist, nor are we fit to force our way on and across. Fortune is the stronger, let us follow her, and turn her course whither she calls. Not far away, I think, are the faithful shores of thy brother Eryx, and the Sicilian haven, if only my memory retraces rightly the stars I watched before. Then good Aeneas, even I ere now discern the winds will have it so, and thou are just against them in vain. Turn thou the course of our sailing. Could any land be welcomer to me, or where I would sooner choose to put in my weary ships, than this that hath Dardanian asks to greet me, and laps in its embrace Lord Anchise's dust? This said, they steer for harbour, while the following west wind stretches their sails, the fleet runs fast down the flood, and at last they land joyfully on the familiar beach. But asks high on a hilltop, amazed at the friendly squadron approaching from afar, hastens towards them, weaponed and clad in the shaggy skin of a Libyan she bear. Him a Trojan mother conceived and bore to Crimisus River, not forgetful of his parentage, he wishes them joy of their return, and gladly entertains them on his rustic treasure, and comforts their weariness with his friendly store. So soon as the morrow's clear daylight had chased the stars out of the east, Aeneas calls his comrades along the beach together, and from a mounded hillock speaks. Great people of Dardanus, born of the high blood of gods, the yearly circle of the months is measured out to fulfilment since we laid the dust in earth, all that was left of my divine father, and sadly consecrated our altars. And now the day is at hand, this, O oh God, was your will, which I will ever keep in grief, ever in honour. Did I spend it in exile on Thulean quicksands? Did it surprise me on the Argolic Sea or in my city town? Yet would I fulfil the yearly vows and annual ordinance of festival, and pile the altars with their due gifts. Now we are led hither, to the very dust and ashes of our father, not as I deem without divine purpose and influence, and borne home into the friendly haven. Up then and let us all gather joyfully to the sacrifice, Pray we for winds, and may he deign that I pay these rites to him year by year in an established city and consecrated temple. Two head of oxen asts, the seed of Troy, gives to each of your ships by tale. Invite to the feast your own ancestral gods of the household, and those whom our host asks worships. Further, so the ninth dawn uplift the gracious day upon men, and her shafts unveil the world, I will ordain contests for my Trojans, first for swift ships. Then also excels in the foot race, and also, confident in strength and skill, comes to shoot light arrows, or adventures to join battle with gloves of raw hide. Let all be here, and let merit look for the prize and palm. Now all be hushed, and twine your temples with bows. So speaks he, and shrouds his brows with his mother's myrtle. So Helimus does, so let's ripe of years, so the boy Asginius, and the rest of the people follow. He advances from the assembly to the tomb among a throng of many thousands that crowd about him. Here he pours on the ground in fit libation two goblets of pure wine, two of new milk, two of consecrated blood, and flings bright blossoms, saying thus, Hail, Holy Father, once again. Hail, 
Ashes of him I saved in vain, and soul and shade of my sire. Thou wert not to share the search for Italian borders and destined fields, nor the Demisonian Tiber. Thus had he spoken, when from beneath the sanctuary a snake slid out in seven vast coils and sevenfold slippery spires, quietly circling the grave and gliding from altar to altar, his green checkered body and the spotted luster of his scales ablaze with gold. As the bow in the cloud darts a thousand changing dyes athwart the sun, Aeneas stood amazed at the sight. At last he wound his long train among the vessels and polished cups, and tasted the feast, and again leaving the altars where he had fed, crept harmlessly back beneath the tomb. Doubtful if he shall think it the genius of the ground or his father's ministrant, he slays, as is fit, two sheep of two years old, as many swine and dark-backed steers, pouring the wild cups of wine, and calling on the soul of great Anchises and the ghost Rerison from Acheron. Therewithal his comrades, as each hath store, bring gifts to heap joyfully on the altars, and slay steers in sacrifice. Others set cauldrons arrow, and, lying along the grass, heap live embers under spits and roast the flesh. The desired day came, and now the ninth dawn rode up clear and bright behind Phaethon's coursers, and the name and renown of illustrious asts had stirred up all the bordering people. Their holiday throng filled the shore, to see Aeneas men, and some ready to join in contest. First of all the prizes are laid out to view in the middle of the racecourse, tripods of sacrifice, green garlands and palms, the reward of the conquerors, armour and garments dipped in purple, talents of silver and gold, and from a hillock, in the midst the trumpet sounds the games begun. First is the contest of rowing, and four ships matched in weight enter, the choice of all the fleet. Mnestheus Ginor's men drive the swift dragon, Mnestheus the Italian to be, from whose name is the Memian family, Gaius the huge bulk of the huge Chimaira, a floating town, whom her triple-tier Dardanian crew urge, and with oars rising in threefold rank, Sergestus, from whom the Sergian house holds her name, sails in the tall centaur, and in the sea-coloured Scylla Cloanthus, whence is thy family, Cluentius of Rome. Apart in the sea and over against the foaming beach, lies a rock that the swollen waves beat and drown, what time the northwestern gales of winter blot out the stars. In calm it rises silent out of the placid water, flat-topped, and a haunt where cormorants love best to take the sun. Here Lord Danius set up a goal of leafy ilex, a mark for the sailors to know whence to return, where to wheel their long course round. Then they choose stations by lot, and on the sterns their captains glitter afar, beautiful in gold and purple. The rest of the crews are crowned with poplar sprays, and their naked shoulders glisten, wet with oil. They sit down at the thwarts, and their arms are tense on the oars. At full strain they wait the signal, while throbbing fear and heightened ambition drain their riotous blood. Then, when the clear trumpet no trang, all in a moment leap forward from their line, the shouts of the sailors strike up to heaven, and the channels are swept into foam by the arms as they swing backward. They cleave their furrows together, and all the sea is torn asunder by oars and triple-pointed prows. Not with speed so headlong do racing pairs whirl the chariots over the plain, as they rush streaming from the barriers. Not so do their charioteers shake the wavy reins loose over their team, and hang forward on the whip. All the woodland rings with clapping and shouts of men that cheer their favourites, and the sheltered beach eddies back their cries. The noise buffets and re-echoes from the hills. Gaius shoots out in front of the noisy crowd, and glides foremost along the water, whom Cloanthus follows next, rowing better, but held back by his dragging weight of pine. After them, at equal distance, the dragon and the centaur strive to win the foremost room, and now the dragon has it, now the vast centaur outstrips and passes her. Now they dart on both together, their stems in a line, and their keels driving long furrows through the salt water ways. And now they drew nigh the rock, and were hard on the goal, when Gaius as he led, winner over half the flood, cries aloud to Menotis, the ship's stairsman, whither away so far to the right, this way direct her path, kiss the shore, and let the oar blade graze the leftward reefs, others may keep to deep water, he spoke, but Menotis, fearing blind rocks, turns the bow away towards the open sea, whither wanderest thou away, to the rocks, Menotis, again shouts Gaius to bring him back, and lo, glancing round he sees Cloanthus passing up behind and keeping nearer. 
Between Jaius' ship and the echoing crags he scrapes through inside on his left, flashes past his leader, and leaving the goal behind is in safe water. Then indeed grief burned fierce through his strong frame, and tears sprung out on his cheek. Heedless of his own dignity, and his crew's safety, he flings the two cautious menotis sheer into the sea from the high stern, himself succeeds as guide and master of the helm, and cheers on his men, and turns his tiller into shore. But Menotis, when at last he rose struggling from the bottom, heavy with advancing years and wet in his dripping clothes, makes for the top of the crag, and sits down on a dry rock. The Teucrians laughed out as he fell and as he swam, and laughed to see him spitting the salt water from his chest. At this a joyful hole kindled in the two behind, Sergestus and Nestheus, of catching up Gaius' wavering course. Sergestus slips forward as he nears the rock, yet not tall in front, nor leading with his length of keel, part is in front, part pressed by the dragon's jealous prow, but striding amidships between his comrades, Nestheus cheers them on, now, now swing back, oarsmen who were Hector's comrades, whom I chose to follow me in Troy's extremity, now put forth the might and courage you showed in Tullian quicksands, amid Ionian seas and Mali's chasing waves. Not the first place do I now seek for Nestheus, nor strive for victory, though ah, yet let them win, O Neptune, to whom thou givest it. But the shame of coming in last, win but this, fellow citizens, and avert the disaster. His men bend forward, straining every muscle, the brass arc of the ship quivers to their mighty strokes, and the ground runs from under her, limbs and parched lips shake with their rapid panting, and sweat flows in streams all over them. Mere chance brought the crew the glory they desired. For while Sergestus drives his prow furiously in towards the rocks and comes up with too scanty room, alas! He caught on a rock that ran out, the reef ground, the oars struck and shivered on the jagged teeth, and the bows crashed and hung. The sailors leap up and hold her with loud cries, and get out iron-shod poles and sharp-pointed bow hooks, and pick up their broken oars out of the eddies. But Mnestheus, rejoicing and flushed by his triumph, with oars fast dipping and winds at his call, issues into the shelving water and runs down the open sea, as a pigeon whose house and sweet nestlings are in the rock's recesses, if suddenly startled from her cavern, wings her flight over the fields and rushes frightened from her house with loud clapping pinions, then gliding noiselessly through the air, slides on her liquid way and moves not her rapid wings, so Mnestheus, so the dragon under him swiftly cleaves the last space of sea, so her own speed carries her flying on. And first Sergestus is left behind, struggling on the steep rock and shoal water, and shouting in vain for help in learning to race with broken oars. Next he catches up Gaius and the vast bulk of the Jemira. She gives way, without her stirsman. And now on the very goal Cloanthus alone is left. Him he pursues and presses, hard, straining all his strength. Then indeed the shouts redouble, as all together eagerly cheer on the pursuer, and the sky echoes their din. These scorn to lose the honour that is their own, the glory in their grasp, and would sell life for renown. To these success lends life, power comes with belief in it. And haply they had carried the prize with prows abreast, had not Cloanthus, stretching both his open hands over the sea, poured forth prayers and called the gods to hear his vows, gods who are sovereign on the sea over whose waters I run, to your altars on this beach will I bring a snow-white bull, my vow's glad penalty, and will cast his entrails into the salt flood and pour liquid wine. He spoke, and far beneath the flood maiden Panopea heard him, with all Furca squire of Nereids, and Lord Portunus, with his own mighty hand pushed him on his way. The ship flies to land swifter than the wind or an arrow's flight, and shoots into the deep harbour. Then the seed of Anchises, Summoning all in order, declares Cloanthus conqueror by herald's outcry, and dresses his brows in green bay, and gives gifts to each crew, three bullocks of their choice, and wine, and a large talent of silver to take away. For their captains he adds special honours, to the winner a scarf wrought with gold, encircled by a double border of deep millibone purple, woven in it is the kingly boy on leafy Ida, chasing swift stags with javelin and racing feet, keen and as one panting. Him Jovi's swooping armour bearer hath caught up from Ida in his talons. His aged guardians stretch their hands vainly upwards, and the barking of hounds rings fierce into the air. But to him who, next in merit, 
held the second place, he gives to wear a corslet triple woven, with hooks of polished gold, stripped by his own conquering hand from Dimoleos under tall Troy by the swift Simwa, an ornament and safeguard among arms. Scarce could the straining shoulders of his servants Phegeus and Sagaris carry its heavy folds, yet with it on, Dimoleos at full speed would chase the scattered Trojans. The third prize he makes twin cauldrons of brass, and bowls wrought in silver and rough with tracery. And now all moved away in the pride and wealth of their prizes, their brows bound with scarlet ribbons, when, hardly torn loose by all his art from the cruel rock, his oars lost, rowing feebly with a single tear, Sergestus brought in his ship jeered at an unhinnered. Even as often a serpent caught on a highway, if a brazen wheel hath gone aslant over him or a wayfarer left him half dead and mangled with the blow of a heavy stone, wreathes himself slowly in vain effort to escape, in part undaunted, his eyes ablaze and his hissing throat lifted high, in part the disabling wound keeps him coiling in knots and twisting back on his own body, so the ship kept rowing slowly on, yet hoists sail and under full sail glides into the harbour mouth. Glad that the ship is saved and the crew brought back, Aeneas presents Sergestus with his promised reward. A slave woman is given him not unskilled in Minerva's labours, followed the Cretan, with twin boys at her breast. This contest sped, good Aeneas moved to a grassy plain girt, all about with winding wooded hills, and amid the valley an amphitheatre, whither, with a concourse of many thousands, the hero advanced and took his seat on a mound. Here he allows with rewards an offer of prizes, those who will try their hap in the fleet foot race. Trojans and Sicilians gather mingling from all sides, Nisus and Euryalus foremost. Euryalus in the flower of youth and famed for beauty, Nisus for pure love of the boy. Next follows renowned Dior's, of Priam's royal line. After him Salius and Patron together, the one a Carnanian, the other Tegian by family and of Arcadian blood. Next two men of Sicily, Helimus and Panopes, foresters and attendants on old asts, many besides whose fame is hid in obscurity. Then among them all Aeneas spoke thus, hearken to this, and attend in good cheer. None out of this number will I let go without a gift. To each will I give two glittering Nogian spearheads of polished steel, and an axe chased with silver to bear away. One and all shall be honoured thus. The three foremost shall receive prizes, and have pale olive bound about their head. The first shall have a caparisoned horse as conqueror, the second an Amazonian quiver filled with arrows of thrace, girt about by a broad belt of gold, and on the link of the clasp a polished gem, let the third depart with this argolic helmet for recompense. This said, they take their place, and the signal once heard, dart over the course and leave the line, pouring forth like a storm cloud while they mark the goal. Nisus gets away first, and shoots out far in front of the throng, fleeter than the winds or the winged thunderbolt. Next to him, but next by a long gap, Salius follows, then, left a space behind him, Euryalus third. And Helimus comes after Euryalus, and close behind him, lo, Dior's goes flying, just grazing foot with foot, hard on his shoulder, and if a longer space were left, he would creep out past him and win the tie. And now almost in the last space, they began to come up breathless to the goal, when unfortunate Nisus drips on the slippery blood of the slain steers, where haply it had spilled over the ground and wetted the green grass. Here, just in the flush of victory, he lost his feet, they slid away on the ground they pressed, and he fell forward right among the order and blood of the sacrifice. Yet forgot he not his darling Euryalus, for rising, he flung himself over the slippery ground in front of Salius, and he rolled over and lay all along on the hard sand. Euryalus shoots by, wins and holds the first place his friend gave, and flies on amid prosperous clapping and cheers. Behind Helimus comes up, and Dior's, now third for the palm. At this Salius fills with loud clamour, the whole concourse of the vast theatre, and the lords who looked on in front, demanding restoration of his defrauded prize. Euryalus is strong in favour, and beauty in tears, and the merit that gains grace from so fair a form. Dior supports him, who succeeded to the palm, so he loudly cries, and bore off the last prize in vain, if the highest honours be restored to Salius. Then Lord Danius speaks, For you, O oh boys, your rewards remain assured, and none alters the prize's order, let me be allowed to pity a friend's innocent missions. 
So speaking, he gives to Sally a vast Tulian lion skin, with shaggy masses of hair and claws of gold. If this, cries Nisus, is the reward of defeat, and thy pity is stirred for the fallen, what fit recompense wilt thou give to Nisus? To my excellence the first crown was due, had not I, like Salius, met fortune's hostility, and with the words he displayed his face and limbs foul with the wet dung. His lord laughed kindly on him, and bade a shield be brought forth, the workmanship of Didyman, torn by him from the hallowed gates of Neptune's Grecian temple. With this special prize he rewards his excellence. Thereafter, when the races are finished and the gifts fulfilled, now, he cries, Come, also hath in him valour and ready heart, and lift up his arms with gauntleted hands. So speaks he, and sets forth the double prize of battle, for the conqueror a bullock gilt and garlanded, a sword and beautiful helmet to console the conquered. Straightway without pause dares issues to view in his vast strength, rising amid loud murmurs of the people, he who alone was wont to meet Paris in combat, he who, at the mound where princely Hector lies, struck down as he came the vast bull cup borne by conquering buttes of Amicus Babrician line, and stretched him in death on the yellow sand. Such was Dares, at once he raises his head high for battle, displays his broad shoulders, and stretches and swings his arms right and left, lashing the air with blows. For him another is required, but none out of all the train durst approach or put the gloves on his hands. So he takes his stand exultant before Aeneas' feet, deeming he excelled all in victories, and thereon without more delay grasps the bull's horn with his left hand, and speaks thus, God is born, if no man dare trust himself to battle, to what conclusion shall I stand? How long is it seemly to keep me? Bid me carry off thy gifts. Therewith all the Dardanians murmured assent, and bade yield him the promised prize. At this age Dast spoke sharply to Entilus, as he sate next him on the green cushion of grass. Entilus, bravest of heroes, once of old in vain, wilt thou thus idly let a gift so great be borne away uncontested? Where now prithee is divine Eryx, thy master of fruitless fame? Where thy renown over all Sicily, and those spoils hanging in thine house? There it he, desire of glory is not gone, nor ambition checked by fear, but torpid age dulls, my chilly blood, and my strength of limb is numb and outworn. If I had what once was mine, if I had now that prime of years, yonder braggart's boast and confidence, it had taken no prize of goodly bullock to allure me, nor had I these gifts. So he spoke, and on that flung down a pair of gloves of giant weight, with whose hard hide bound about his wrists valiant Eryx was wont to come to battle. They stood amazed, so stiff and grim lay the vast sevenfold axe hide, so dain with lead and iron. Dares most of all shrinks far back in horror, and the noble son of Anchises turns round this way and the their vast weight in voluminous folds. Then the old man spoke thus in deep accents, How had they seen the gloves that were Hercules' own armour, and the fatal fight on this very beach? These arms thy brother Eryx once wore, thou seest them yet stained with blood and spattered brains. In them he stood to face great Alcides. To them was I used while fuller blood supplied me strength, and envious old age had not yet strewn her snows on either temple. But if dares of Troy will have none of these are arms, and good Aeneas is resolved on it, and my patron asks approve, let us make the battle even. See, I give up the gauntlets of Eric. Dismiss thy fears, and do thou put off thy Trojan gloves. So spoke he, and throwing back the fold of his raiment from his shoulders, he bears the massive joints and limbs, the great bones and muscles, and stands up huge in the middle of the ground. Then Anchise's lordly seed brought out equal gloves and bound the hands of both in matched arms. Straightway each took his stand on tiptoe, and undauntedly raised his arms high in air. They lift their heads right back and away out of reach of blows, and make hand play through hand, inviting attack, the one nimbler of foot and confident in his youth, the other mighty in massive limb, but his knees totter tremulous and slow, and sick panting shakes his vast frame. Many a mutual blow they deliver in vain, many and one they redouble on chest and side, sounding hollow and loud. Hands play fast about ear and temple, and jawbones clash under the hard strokes. Old Entilus stands immovable in a strain, only parrying hits with body and watchful eye. The other, 
as one who casts mounts against some high city or blockades a hill fort in arms, tries this and that entrance, and ranges cunningly over all the ground, and presses many an attack in vain. Entelus rose and struck clean out with his right downwards. His quick opponent saw the descending blow before it came, and slid his body rapidly out of its way. Entelus hurled his strength into the air, and all his heavy mass, overreaching, fell heavily to the earth, as sometime on a Rhymanthus or mighty Ida a hollow pine falls torn out by the roots. Teucrians and men of Sicily rise eagerly, a cry goes up, and Ast himself runs forward, and pityingly lifts his friend and birthmet from the ground. But the hero, not dulled nor dismayed by his mishap, returns the keener to battle, and grows violent in wrath, while shame and resolved valour kindle his strength. All afire, he hunts Dare's head long over the lists, and redoubles his blows now with right hand, now with left, no breath nor pause. Heavy as hailstones rattle on the roof from a storm cloud, so thickly showered the blows from both his hands as he buffets Dare's to and fro. Then Lord Danius allowed not wrath to swell higher or Entelus to rage out his bitterness, but stopped the fight and rescued the exhausted Dares, saying thus in soothing words, Unhappy? What height of madness hath seized thy mind? Knowest thou not the strength is another's, and the gods are changed? Yield thou to heaven. And with the words he proclaimed the battle over. But him his faithful mates lead to the ships, dragging his knees feebly, swaying his head from side to side, and spitting from his mouth clotted blood mingled with teeth. At summons they bear away the helmet and shield, and leave palm and bolt to Entelus. At this the conqueror, swelling in pride over the bull, cries, God is born, and you, O Trojans, learn thus what my strength of body was in its prime, and from what a death dares is saved by your recall. He spoke, and stood right opposite, in face of the bullock, as it stood by, the prize of battle, then drew back his hand, and swinging the hard gauntlet sheer down between the horns, smashed the bones in upon the shattered brain. The ox rolls over, and quivering and lifeless lies along the ground. Above it he utters these deep accents, this life, Eryx, I give to thee, a better payment, and heir's death. Here I lay down my gloves in unconquered skill. Forthwith Aeneas invites all that will to the contest of the swift arrow, and proclaims the prizes. With his strong hand he ukers the mast of Serestus ship, and on a cord crossing it hangs from the masthead a fluttering pigeon as mark for their steel. They gather, and a helmet of brass takes the lots as they throw them in. First in rank, and before them all, amid prosperous cheers, comes out Hippocoon son of Hyrtacus, and Mnestheus follows on him, but now conqueror in the ship race, Mnestheus with his chapet of green olive. Third is Eurytion, thy brother, O Pandarus, great in renown, thou who of old, when prompted to shatter the truce, didst hurl a first shaft amid the aliens. Last of all, and at the bottom of the helmet, Sankasts, he too venturing to set hand to the task of youth. Then each and all they strongly bend their bows into a curve and pull shafts from their quivers. And first the arrow of the son of Hyrtacus, flying through heaven from the sounding string, whistles through the fleet breezes, and reaches and sticks fast full in the mast's wood. The mast quivered, and the bird fluttered her feathers in affright, and the whole ground rang with loud clapping. Next valiant Mnestheus took his stand with bow bent, aiming high with levelled eye and arrow, yet could not, unfortunate, hit the bird herself with his steel, but cut the knotted hempen bands that tied her foot as she hung from the masthead. She winged her flight into the dark windy clouds. Then Eurytion, who ere now held the arrow ready on his bended bow, swiftly called in prayer to his brother, marked the pigeon as she now went down the empty sky exultant on clapping wings, and as she passed under a dark cloud, struck her, she fell breathless, and, leaving her life in the airy firmament, slid down carrying the arrow that pierced her. Ast's alone was over, and the prize lost, yet he sped his arrow up into the air, to display his lordly skill and resounding bow. At this a sudden sign meets their eyes, mighty inaugural presage, as the high event taught the rafter, and in late days boding seers prophesied of the omen. For the flying reed blazed out amid the swimming clouds, traced its path in flame, and burned away on the light winds, even as often stars shooting from their sphere draw a train athwart the sky. Trinacrians and Trojans hung in astonishment, praying to the heavenly powers, 
neither did great Aeneas reject the omen, but embraces gladasts and loads him with lavish gifts, speaking thus, Take, my lord, for the high king of heaven by these signs hath willed thee to draw the lot of peculiar honour. This gift shall thou have as from age Danchise's own hand, a bowl embossed with figures, that once Sisius of Thrace gave my father Anchises to bear, in high token and grudin of affection. So speaking, he twines green bay about his brows, and proclaims Ast's conqueror first before them all. Nor did gentle Eurition, though he alone struck the bird down from the lofty sky, grudge him to be preferred in honour. Next comes for his prize he who cut the cord, he last, who pished the mast with his winged reed. But Lord Danius, ere yet the contest is sped, calls to him Epitides, guardian and attendant of Ungron Eulus, and thus speaks into his faithful ear, up and away, and tell Asgenius, if he now holds his band of boys ready, and their horses arrayed for the charge, to defile his squadrons to his grandsire's honour in bravery of arms. So says he, and himself bids all the crowding throng withdraw from the long racecourse and leave the lists free. The boys move in before their parents' faces, glittering in rank on their bitted horses, as they go all the people of Troy and Trinacria murmur and admire. On the hair of them all rests a garland fitly trimmed, each carries two cornel spear shafts tipped with steel, some have polished quivers on their shoulders, above their breast and round their neck goes a flexible circuit of twisted gold. Three in number are the troops of riders, and three captains gallop up and down, following each in equal command rides a glittering division of twelve boys. One youthful line goes rejoicingly behind little Priam, renewer of his grandsire's name, thy renowned seed, O Polites, and destined to people Italy. He rides a Thracian horse dappled with spots of white, showing white on his pacing pasterns and white on his high forehead. Second is Atis, from whom the Latinati draw their line, little Atis, boy beloved of the boy Eulus. Last and excellent in beauty before them all, Eulus rode in on a Sidonian horse that Dido the bright had given him for token and pledge of love. The rest of them are mounted on old ass Sicilian horses. The Dardanians greet their shy entrance with applause, and rejoice at the view, and recognize the features of their parents of old. When they have ridden merrily round all the concourse of their gazing friends, Epitides shouts from afar the signal they await, and sounds his whip. They gallop apart in equal numbers, and open their files three and three in deploying bands, and again at the call wheel about and bear down with levelled arms. Next they start on other charges and other retreats in corresponsive spaces, and interlink circle with circle, and wage the armed phantom of battle. And now they bear their backs in flight, now turn their lances to the charge, now plight peace and ride on side by side. As once of old, they say, the labyrinth, in High Crete had a tangled path between blind walls and a thousand ways of doubling treachery, where tokens to follow failed in the maze unmastered and irrecoverable. Even in such a track do the children of Troy entangle their footsteps and weave the game of flight in battle, like dolphins who, swimming through the wet seas, cut Carpathian or Libyan. This fashion of riding, these games Ascanius first revived, when he girt Alba the long about with walls, and taught their celebration to the old Latin, in the way of his own boyhood, with the youth of Troy about him. The Albans taught it their children, on from the mighty Rome received it and kept the ancestral observance, and now it is called Troy, and the boys the Trojan troop. Thus far sped the sacred contests to their holy lord, just at this fortune broke faith and grew estranged. While they pay the due rites to the tomb with diverse games, Juno, daughter of Saturn, sends Iris down the sky to the alien fleet, and breathes a gale to speed her on, revolving many a thought, and not yet satiate of the ancient pain. She, speeding her way along the thousand-coloured bow, runs swiftly, seen of none, down her maiden path. She discerns the vast concourse, and traverses the shore, and sees the haven abandoned and the fleet left alone. But far withdrawn by the solitary verge of the sea, the Trojan women wept their lost anchises, and as they wept gazed all together on the fathomless flood. Alas! After all those weary waterways, that so wide a sea is yet to come, such is the single cry of all. They pray for a city, sick of the burden of their sea sorrow. So she darts among them, not witless to harm, and lays by face and raiment of a goddess, 
she becomes Bero, the aged wife of Tamari and Oryclus, who had once had birth in name and children, and in this guise goes among the Dardanian matrons. Ah, wretched we, she cries, whom hostile Arian hands did not drag to death beneath her native city. Ah, hapless race, for what destruction does fortune hold thee back? The seventh summer now declines since Troy's overthrow, while we pass measuring out by so many stars the harbourless rocks over every water and land, pursuing all the while over the vast sea in Italy that flies us, and tossing on the waves. Here are our brother Eric's, borders, and us welcome, who denies us to cast up walls and give our citizens a city? O country, O household gods vainly rescued from the foe, shall there never be a Trojan town to tell of? Shall I know where see a Xanthus and a Simwa, the rivers of Hector? Nay, up and join me in burning with fire these illuminous ships. For in sleep the phantom of Cassandra the soothsayer seemed to give me blazing brands. Here seek your Troy, she said. Here is your home. Now is the time to do it. Nor do these high portents allow delay. Behold four altars to Neptune. The god himself lends the firebrand and the nerf. Speaking thus, at once she strongly seizes the fiery weapon, and with straining hand whirls it far euprude, and flings. The souls of the alien women are startled and their wits amazed. At this one of their multitude, and she the eldest, Pergo, nurse in the palace to all Priam's many children. This is not Bero, I tell you, O mothers, this is not the wife of Doryclus of Ruatum. Mark the lineaments of divine grace and the gleaming eyes. What a breath is hers, what a countenance and the sound of her voice and the steps of her going. I, I time ago left Bero apart, sick and fretting that she alone must have no part in this her service, nor pay Anchises his due sacrifice. So spoke she. But the matrons at first, dubious and wavering, gazed on the ships with malignant eyes, between the wretched longing for the land they trod, and the fated realm that summoned them, when the goddess rose through the sky on poised wings, and in her flight through a vast bow beneath the clouds. Then indeed, amazed at the tokens and driven by madness, they raise a cry and snatch fire from the hearths within. Others plunder the altars, and cast on brushwood boughs and brands. The fire god rages with loose rain over thwarts and oars and hulls of painted fur. Eumelus carries the news of the burning ships to the grave of Anchises and the ranges of the theatre, and looking back, their own eyes see the floating cloud of dark ashes. And in a moment Ascanius, as he rode gaily before his cavalry, spurred his horse to the disordered camp, nor can his breathless guardians hold him back. What strange madness is this? He cries, Whither now hasten you, whither, alas and woe, O citizens, not on the foe nor on some hostile Argive camp, it is your own hopes you burn. Behold me, your Ascanius, and he flung before his feet the empty helmet, put on when he roused the mimicry of war. Aeneas and the Trojan train together hurry to the spot, but the women scatter apart in fear all over the beach, and stealthily seek the woods and the hollow rocks they find. They loathe their deed and the daylight, and with changed eyes know their people, and Juno is startled out of their breast. But not thereby do the flames of the burning lay down their unconquered strength. Under the wet oak the seams are alive, spouting slow coils of smoke. The creeping heat devours the hulls, and the destroyer takes deep hold of all. Nor does the hero's strength avail nor the floods they pour in. Then good Aeneas rent away the raiment from his shoulders and called the gods to aid, stretching forth his hands. Jupiter omnipotent, if thou hadst not Troy yet holy to her last man, if thine ancient pity looks at all on human woes, now, O Lord, grant her fleet to escape the flame, and rescue from doom the slender Teucrian estate. Or do thou plunge to death this remnant, if I deserve it, with levelled thunderbolt, and here with thine own hand smite us down. Scarce had he uttered this, when a black tempest rages in streaming showers, earth trembles to the thunder on plain and steep. The water flood rushes in torrents from the whole heaven amid black darkness and volleying blasts of the south. The ships are filled from overhead, the half-burned timbers are soaking, till all the heat is quenched, and all the hulls, but four that are lost, are rescued from destruction. But Lord Danius, dismayed by the bitter missions, revolved at heart this way and that his shifting weight of care, whether, forgetting fate, he should rest in Sicilian fields, 
or reach forth to the borders of Italy. Then old knots, whom Tritonian palace taught like none other, and made famous in eminence of art, she granted him to reply what the gods' heavy anger menaced or what the order of fate claimed. He then in accents of comfort thus speaks to Aeneas, Goddess born, follow we fatty's ebb and flow, whatsoever it shall be, fortune must be born to be overcome. Astas of thy known divine Dardanian race, take him, for he is willing, to join thee in common counsel, deliver to him those who are over, now these ships are lost, and those who are quite weary of thy fortunes and the great quest. Choose out the old men stricken in years, and the matrons sick of the sea, and all that is weak and fearful of peril in thy company. Let this land give a city to the weary, they shall be allowed to call their town Asta by name. Then, indeed, kindled by these words of his aged friend, his spirit is distracted among all his cares. And now black knight rose chariot born, and held the sky, when the likeness of his father Anchises seemed to descend from heaven and suddenly utter thus, O son, more dear to me than life once of old while life was yet mine, O son, hard wrought by the destinies of Ilium, I come hither by Jove's command, who drove the fire from thy fleets, and at last had pity out of high heaven, obey thou the fair counsel aged knots now gives, carry through to Italy thy chosen men and bravest souls, in Latium must thou war down a people hard and rough in living. Yet ere then draw thou nigh the nether chambers of Dis, and in the deep tract of hell come, O son, to meet me. For I am not held in cruel Tartarus among wailing ghosts, but inhabit Elysium and the sweet societies of the good. Hither with much blood of dark cattle shall the holy Sibyl lead thee. Then shalt thou learn of all thy line, and what city is given thee. And now farewell, dank night wheels her mid-career, and even now I feel the stern breath of the panting horses of the east. He ended, and retreated like a vapour into thin air. Ah, whither hurriest thou? cries Aeneas. Whither so fast away? From whom flist thou? Or who withholds thee from her embrace? So speaking, he kindles the sleeping embers of the fire, and with holy meal and laden censer does sacrifice to the tutelar of Pergama and Hor Vesta's secret shrine. Straightway he summons his crews and asks first of all, and instructs them of Jove's command and his beloved father's precepts, and what is now his fixed mind and purpose. They linger not in council, nor does Ast decline his bidden duty. They enroll the matrons in their town, and plant a people there, souls that will have none of glory. The rest repair the thwarts and replace the ship's timbers that the flames had gnawed upon, and fit up oars and rigging, little in number, but alive and valiant for war. Meanwhile Aeneas traces the town with the plough and allots the homesteads. This he bids be Ilium, and these lands Troy. Trojan asks, rejoicing in his kingdom, appoints a court and gathers his senators to give them statutes. Next, where the crest of Eryx is neighbour to the stars, a dwelling is founded to Venus the Adalian, and a priest in breadth of holy wood is attached to Anchises' grave. And now for nine days all the people hath feasted, and offering been paid at the altars, quiet breezes have smoothed the ocean floor, and the gathering south wind blows, calling them again to sea. A mighty weeping arises along the winding shore, a night and a day they linger in mutual embraces. The very mothers now, the very men to whom once the sight of the sea seemed cruel and the name intolerable, would go on and endure the journey's travail to the end. These Aeneas comforts with kindly words, and commends with tears to his kinsman Astskir. Then he bids slay three steers to Eryx, and a shilam to the tempests, and loose the hawser as is due. Himself, his head bound with strip leaves of olive, he stands apart on the prow, holding the cup, and casts the entrails into the salt flood and pours liquid wine. A wind rising astern follows them forth on their way. Emulously the crews strike the water, and sweep through the seas. But Venus meanwhile, wrought upon with distress, accosts Neptune, and thus pours forth her heart's complaint. Juno's bitter wrath and heart insatiable compel me, O Neptune, to sink to the uttermost of entreaty, neither length of days nor any goodness softens her, nor doth Jove's command and fate itself break her to desistance. It is not enough that her accursed hatred hath devoured the Phrygian city from among the people, and exhausted on it the stores of vengeance, still she pursues this remnant, the bones and ashes of murdered Troy. I pray she know why her passion is so fierce. 
Thyself art my witness what a sudden stir she raised of late on the Libyan waters, flinging all the seas to heaven in vain reliance on Aeolus blasts, this she dared in thy realm. Lo too, driving the Trojan matrons into guilt, she hath fully burned their ships, and forced them, their fleet lost, to leave the crews to an unknown land. Let the remnant, I beseech thee, give their sails to thy safe keeping across the seas, let them reach Laurentine Tiber, if I ask what is permitted, if fate grants them a city there. Then the son of Saturn, compeller of the ocean deep, uttered thus, It is wholly right, O Scytherian, that thy trust should be in my realm, whence thou drawest birth, and I have deserved it. Often have I allayed the rage and full fury of sky and sea. Nor less on land, I call Xanthus and Simwa to witness, hath been my care of thine Aeneas. When Achilles pursued the Trojan armies and hurled them breathless on their walls, and sent many thousands to death, when the choked rivers groaned and Xanthus could not find passage or roll out to sea, then I snatched Aeneas away in sheltering mist as he met the brave son of Peleus, outmatched in strength and gods, eager as I was to overthrow the walls of perjured Troy that mine own hands had built. Now too my mind rests the same, dismiss thy fear. In safety, as thou disarrest, shall he reach the haven of Avernus. One will there be alone whom on the flood thou shalt lose and require, one life shall be given for many. With these words the goddess bosom is soothed to joy. Then their lord yokes his wild horses with gold and fastens the foaming bits, and letting all the reins run slack in his hand, flies lightly in his sea-coloured chariot over the ocean surface. The waves sink to rest, and the swollen water weighs smooth out under the thundering axle. The storm clouds scatter from the vast sky. Diverse shapes attend him, monstrous whales, and Glaucus aged choir, and Pullaman, son of Eno, the swift Jutins, and Furcus with all his army. Thetis and Melite keep the left, and Maiden Panopea, Nisaia and Spio, Thalia and Cymodos. At this Lord Aeneas' soul is thrilled with soft counterchange of delight. He bids all the masts be euchred with speed, and the sails stretched on the yards. Together all set their sheets, and all at once slacken their canvas to left and again to right. Together they brace and unbrace, the yard arms aloft. Prosperous gales waft the fleet along. First, in front of all, Palinurus steered the close column, the rest under orders ply their course by his. And now dewy night had just reached heaven's mid-cone. The sailors, stretched on their hard benches under the oars, relaxed their limbs in quiet rest. When sleep, sliding lightly down from the starry sky, parted the shadow ear and cleft the dark, seeking thee, O Palinurus, carrying dreams of bale to thee who dreamt not of harm, and lit on the high stern, a god in Forbus likeness, dropping this speech from his lips, Palinurus son of Iasus, the very seas bear our fleet along, the breezes breathe steadily, for an hour rest is given, lay down thine head, and steal thy worn eyes from their toil, I myself for a little will take thy duty in thy stead, to whom Palinurus, scarcely lifting his eyes, returns, thou have me ignorant what the calm face of the brine means, and the waves at rest. Shall I have faith in this perilous thing? How shall I trust Aeneas to deceitful breezes, and the placid treachery of sky that hath so often deceived me? Such words, he uttered, and, clinging fast to the tiller, slackened hold no wit, and looked up steadily on the stars. Lo! The god shakes over either temple a bow dripping with lehian dew and made slumberous with the might of sticks and makes his swimming eyes relax their struggles. Scarcely had sleep begun to slacken his limbs unaware, when bending down, he flung him sheer into the clear water, tearing rudder and half astern away with him, and many a time crying vainly on his comrades. Himself he rose on flying wings into the thin air. Nonetheless does the fleet run safe on its sea path, and glides on unalarmed in Lord Neptune's assurance. Yes, and now they were sailing into the cliffs of the Sirens, Dangerous once of old and white with the bones of many a man, and the horse rocks echoed afar in the ceaseless surf, when her lord felt the ship rocking astray for loss of her helmsman, and himself steered her on over the darkling water, sighing often the while, and heavy at heart for his friend's misshins. I took trustful in skies and sea serenity, thou shalt lie, O Palinurus, naked on an alien sand. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you again for book 6 of the Aeneid.
If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.